So our, our guest speaker for this evening is um, John Burren uh, on 60 years of software development. I'm sure John will um, introduce himself and say a little bit more about uh, his subject and uh, where he's coming from in terms of his uh, 60 years of, of software experience. Thank you, John. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to start right at the beginning. Um, and uh, after the Second World War, in the, the second half of uh, the, the 1940s, uh, there were three efforts in the UK to design and build a digital computer. Uh, these three efforts were at Manchester University, at Cambridge University, and then for the National Physical Laboratory, which, as pro probably most of you know, is, is, is on the west of London. And the machines that, that they designed and started to build were called the Mark I at Manchester, the EDSAC at, uh, at Cambridge, and at MPL, a machine called the ACE, the Automatic Computing, <coughs> Computing Engine. Um, and two of these were working by 1950, the machine at Manchester and the machine at Cambridge. I, I even, uh, sort of luckily, actually, can verify that because as a schoolboy in 1950, in the summer of 1950, we had a trip to see a computer at Cambridge and, uh, and on a, a, a really lovely sunny, sunny Saturday afternoon, we, we went and saw the EDSAC and they were very pleased because they said, uh, we can actually show you it running a program. And the, the, the program they ran was to calculate the value of pi. And, uh, and they ran this program and uh, it, it typed out on, on an electric typewriter, which I assume is probably the console typewriter. And, uh, and the electric typewriter in those days was not the golf ball, it was uh, keys on stalks. And it, it typed out 3.1415, <laughs> rather slowly, actually. <laughs> so that you could sort of, you know, you could see it thinking <laughs> as it got to the 1.5. The, the, the and uh, and uh, so, so it was working. And um, they also showed us, the, other, the only other thing I remember was that they showed us the memory which was uh, mercury delay lines. And this, this was in a sort of barrel, uh, a bit bigger than a dustbin, um, uh, uh, a bit all black <laughs> on the outside. And they told us there were, there were these tubes of mercury inside. Uh, and it, they were, it was filled with oil. And that uh, you had to keep the temperature very constant. And that was quite a job. And uh, I expect that was, they said that because it was, it was a baking afternoon and, and people didn't have air conditioning in those days. And uh, obviously the machine gave out quite a lot of uh, heat. At any rate, uh, that, that's, uh, that's the story at Cambridge. At NPL, the story is rather different because Alan Turing designed the ACE and uh, it was a a more ambitious machine than either of the other two. And the MPL decided that they didn't have the resources to build it. Uh, and uh, Turing <laughs> completed the design, but then he left and, uh, and went to Manchester. And then in 1950, uh, the MPL decided to build a sort of cut down version of the ACE, which they called the Pilot ACE. And that was, that was working, I think, in 1951. Okay, now I've written underneath, th these three were associated with companies. Manchester were associated with Ferranzi. Cambridge with Joe Lyons, which, which were a catering company. Um, the, younger, the older ones, if you 
may have been to a lion's tea shop or a <coughs> lion's corner house, and the other was it's English Electric, and those were the names they gave the computers, the Mark I Star, the Leo I, and the Juice, and they were commercial versions of, of these early machines. Okay, all those companies have gone, I should say. Um, so we come to 1956, and now we'll see why the title is 60 years. Uh, I was recruited <coughs> by the Harwell Computing Group at Harwell because they were going to get a Mercury computer. That was in the summer of 1956. But I didn't actually get there until the end of September because... Uh, because uh, security vetting was, was rather, rather a serious business, I didn't find out for some while that the, a guy called Brian Flowers, you may, you may have heard of him, he became Lord Flowers and so on, was the head of the theoretical physics division. And I didn't know for a long while <laughs> that his predecessor had been one Klaus Fuchs, <laughs> who was at the, then in prison as one of the atom spies. At any rate, I, I arrived... And they told me that uh, the Mercury was going to be a year late, and so instead of joining the computer group, I was going to join the particle accelerator theory group. And so by that, that accident, uh, I joined the applied side of the business rather than the pure side of the business. And uh, I was immediately uh, sent off to the NPL to write a program to solve a, a differential equation that well, was the particle, of, well, it was the, the equation of motion of a particle in a magnetic field. And so my first program that I wrote was in 1956, was for the Dukes. Um, actually, they almost called it the pilot ace of MPL, but it was actually a Dukes. And um, uh, Writing programs for the Jews was quite a business, I should say. I have, I, there was certainly no manual, and I have no idea how I actually managed, I can't remember how I managed to write a program. The only thing I can remember is that there were programming sheets, and uh, you, you wrote your program on these. And the interesting thing was that, um, one of the interesting things was that... Um, Delay line memory has ha had a nasty problem, and that was that if if you executed the instructions as they were in memory, one after another, that's what you normally do. <coughs> then, uh, you, while you were executing an instruction, the next one would come out of the delay line and go around back in at the top. And, uh, and so when, when you wanted the next instruction, it would be starting on its way down the delay line. And effectively that meant that um, you only got one instruction per cycle of the delay line. And the delay line cycles about a millisecond, so you, you only got a thousand instructions a second if you did this. And Turing didn't like that. So, so he... He, he gave each, he said each instruction should have an address of where the next instruction is to be found. And so when you'd written your program, you then started a sort to put the instructions in an order that meant that uh, when you completed an instruction, it was quite likely that the next one would be sort of coming out of the delay line fairly soon afterwards. At any rate, um, also, um, there was no assembler, and, uh, and uh, the machine used punch cards. I put one of these up on the board. I, can, can you see that all right? Um, it, 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 has, uh, it has 80 columns uh, and 12 rows, and uh, the, the, the way the machine worked you, you, you use the first 32 columns. It was a 32-bit machine. You use the first 32 columns, and you punched uh, the instructions in, in the 12 instructions in the first 32 columns. And uh, there was no assembler, so you had to convert your instructions into binary, and then punch them hole by hole on a car on one of these cards. 
and, uh, and your card deck was your program. And, uh, and debugging was, was the usual business. You, you, got, you got half an hour or something, and uh, you got as much done as you could, and then you waited for the, your half, half hour on your, the next day. Fortunately, I shared an office with a couple of students, PhD students from UCL, and they helped me do all this. And uh, I got it debugged. There's, there's one very interesting thing about this, and that is it's, it's very easy if you want to correct a card to punch another hole in it. But what, what, what do you do if you want to get rid of a hole? And, uh, and uh, you, you'll see that... <laughs> If you look at the top, if you tried to get rid of one of those holes in the middle of that row, it looks pretty difficult. But actually, what, what you did was, there were always these chads lying around. These are the chads of, um, of uh, Bush v. Gore um, election. There were, there were always chads lying around, and you, you, you put one on your finger, and you then guided it into the hole, and rubbed it over with your nail. And this was quite effective, actually. You could, you could copy cards, but uh, if, you could, had, couldn't do the, <laughs> if you couldn't fill holes in, you were in real trouble. At any rate, I eventually got this program to work, and uh, my boss had arranged that um, Howell didn't have a computer, so we could, we, we, we could go to uh, Aldermaston, which was the weapons place near, near Newbury. They had a juice, and uh, we ran on the juice at the weekends. So they let us use their machine at the weekends. And I was very lucky, because um, what I'd done was to write a program that solved a nonlinear differential equation. And I didn't know when I was doing this that there was just, there's no way of solving nonlinear differential equations. Uh, you can only do it numerically. And so nobody had seen the solutions to the, the sort of equation that, that I was dealing with. And my boss, who was an expert, who was a mathematician who was an expert in differential equations, was very interested in looking at the answers because nobody had ever seen the answers. And, uh, and they, they were spectacularly interesting. They, weren't, they were very complicated. And, uh, they were, it was similar, you know, you know much later on, there, there, were, there was all this business about transformations of various sorts that gave these marvelous patterns. And in fact, we'd actually hit on some early version of that. that. But uh, as, the, as my boss said, nobody's going to build an accelerator based on, spend a million pounds on an accelerator. At any rate, Eventually, the Mercury arrived in 1958, and uh, as you see, I've put up there, it, it, they'd used the year, fortunately, uh, to get a random access of memory. Uh, memory built on little magnetic cores had been invented by then, and, uh, and they'd used the year to change from delay lines to, uh, to a random access memory. Incidentally, I mean, it's, it seems odd now that people talk about RAM. Why, oh, oh, why bother with the R? Ah, ah, but um, <coughs> that, that, that's why. That, that. And um, I'd actually been on a course, a fortnight's course in Manchester to learn the, the machine code of the Ferranti Mercury. And we'd had a talk for half a day by somebody called Tony Brooker, on, on, on a language called Autocode, for which he'd written a compiler. And uh, the machine came with Autocode. And um, when it came, I, I thought, well, I'll have a go at it. I, I must have had the manual from this course, and I wrote a program to work out some tables that were interesting for accelerators. And uh, within a day, day or two, I had, I had had the sheet. I even have a copy of it. <laughs> it's one of the things I pr did preserve. And, uh, and what happened was, was quite remarkable, really. 
we'd worked for a year on the Jews, and nobody in the group had written a pro or even sort of made any move towards writing a program for it. And, uh, and I, had, I had not written any other program, I just altered the, the program I had originally written. But as soon as the Mercury came along with Autocode, everybody in the group started to write programs. And I think the same happened in Harwell, that the, the people started to, to, use, to use the Mercury and they all used Autocode. They didn't, didn't write machine code. And uh, it, was, it was really a, rather a good computer. It was well balanced. Uh, you know, it, it, it had about the sort of memory that needed to go with its speed and it had autocode and so on. And uh, we, uh, we did, sorry, I don't know whether this looks terribly good. We did one very large calculation in autocode, the final one we did, which was to design a proton linear accelerator, which you can see here. Proton linear accelerator is a is a great uh, copper cylinder. That that's about a meter, it's a meter round, and that's about twelve meters long. And you put a, an electric field, an oscillating electric field, in here, that, in this this direction. And of course, that wouldn't accelerate anything because half the time the field be be slowing it down. So you you put. Uh, tubes in and you send the particles in bunches and when the field is in the wrong direction they hide inside the tube and then they get accelerated in the gap and then the field changes and they hide in the next one and there were about 50 of these and, um, and uh, uh, you, ha you have to uh, they, they get bigger because the particles speed up and so the, the gap gets bigger and the, and the, and the, and the, um, the hidey hole gets bigger. They're called drift tubes. And uh, there were about 50 of these in, in the machine we had. And uh, you, you, the design had to sort of make it so that a reference particle was in the middle between them. Uh, at a certain phase of the uh, of the field, and uh, that needs a lot of iterations, working out what the field is in the gap and all the rest of it. And uh, to to do that took four hours to make a design. And uh, the program is actually just about as big as you want to handle. It, it was four reels of paper tape. Paper tape is a horrible media but cheap and uh, and uh, we made the design of this you had to iterate the design because the building was already there and the total length of the thing it had to go in the building and uh, it also the energy had to be right because it was going it was the injector for another accelerator but that was a big calculation and uh, and it was a, it sort of marked a, a turning point really because um, the engineers and the people who built these things were not used to getting data from theorists and th th theorists had ideas most of which were bonkers in their view <laughs> and, uh, and they were unused to this but uh, this was accepted and uh, it was slightly odd because, of course, we designed in, in metric and we gave the engineers the dimensions in centimetres. <laughs> Didn't we know <laughs> metal bashers worked in inches <laughs> and mills, not in centimetres? Anyway, I do know, I do, we had to, we had to, <laughs> You know, things were, were such that you, you didn't try and convert these numbers <laughs> using the, the mercury, you did it by hand. And uh, so I know that they actually built the accelerator using this design. And then,
1959, things changed. In 1959, Alder Marston started to rent an IBM 709, and they started running the Fortran monitor system, the FMS, and Harwell started using this service. And the way this the way that this service worked was that the FMS used <coughs> two machines. An 1130, which was a, s a small business machine, which, which had a, a card reader and a line printer and a tape deck. They, they were used by businesses, usually for payroll, that sort of thing. And then the 709. <coughs> and uh, what happened was that you, you loaded programs onto a magnetic tape using the 1130. And, and that, 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 was, that was then driven to Aldermaston. And of course Aldermaston would have had their own 1130 for their work, but uh, for, for Harwell, the, uh, the car took the tape over to the 709. Uh, the 709 produce line printer and cards output on magnetic tape. The tape was then brought back to Harwell and converted into printing and punching of output. And you got two shots a day, one at lunchtime, one over lunchtime, and one overnight. <coughs> and Actually, we found Fortran rather disappointing. Um, already, um, while we were still using the Mercury, that would be back in '58, people were talking about new languages. That, that Br Brooker was, was working on a compiler, compiler, which was was a compiler that would be good for writing compilers, and I think Algol was being thought of, and so on. And uh, I know for some reasons that the people were very excited about the possibility of re-entrant routines, i.e. routines that could c call themselves. I don't know wh why people were interested in that, I can't, um, but they were. And then any rate, Fortran, with this lovely new machine, it had 32K of memory now. Uh, Fortran seemed a bit sort of it wasn't, you know, much different from autocode. It didn't seem a great step up, and so it seemed rather disappointing. It also looked messy because it, it was all in capital letters, which, which, uh, you know, mathematics uses lowercase, and so it looked looked messy. However, the FMS itself r represented a sort of. A, it's hard to describe. Within a few weeks, computing had gone from pioneering to a routine activity. It, it, it's, very, very, uh, it's, it's hard to believe, almost. But p people knew they had two shots a day. They didn't even see the machine. They, they just handed your cards in, and, and, and you came back a couple of hours later, and there was your line printer output. And, if you'd compiled some routines, you, you got binary cards for these, and then you make it made up your next go, and so on. And it, it, it became a very much a routine matter. And uh, I've now said we've moved from pioneering to the big machine era. And in my sort of reckoning, that lasted for the next 20 years. Oh. I'm, I'm just, this is a, this is, you probably, I don't know, can you see better than I can see here? This is a, a Fortran card, um, which, which is what you punch your programs on, not in binary, I should say. You, 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 you had a sort of machine with a typewriter and so on, and, that punch these cards, and you see that at the top it, 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 it has printed what the instruction is, uh, which is Z, I equals something or another, and W, 
I couldn't get a, uh, I looked on the web and I couldn't get any better than, than that. Um, uh, but that, that's how you put your programs on punch cards, and that's what we used. Okay, so the big machine era. We used the 7090 until the Rutherford in, which had split off from Harwell by then, it was an independent. We, we bought a, a System 360 75. Um, and um, we did, we did, we did, all, we also bought a Ferranti Orion, w which wasn't a great success, unfortunately. Um, this was m because, rather foolishly, they made a, a serious management <laughs> error, and that is they, I mean, in those days. Circuitry of, was changing from valves to to transistors to solid state, and the the, the technology used wasn't sort of fixed. And Ferranti decided to use a, a particular technology that I assume was cheap. I don't know why they chose it, but they found out fairly shortly that it was very fragile, and. They, they decided wrongly, of course, that they, they were, it was too late to change to a more standard technology. And they went on and they made the Iran. The Iran was like a 709 with, with a more modern design, so it was multi-programming. Um, but it, they made it, and, but it was very fragile. It needed a huge amount of maintenance to keep it going. Um, we, we wrote a Fortran compiler for it so that we have one locally and then it was mainly used with, with measuring machines. We were working on bubble chip, m measuring bubble chain of film which was what nuclear physicists did in those days. At any rate, in 66 we got a 360-75 we bought this machine, and uh, it, it was it was a sort of slightly contentious decision because CERN had bought a CDC sixty six hundred, uh, which which was uh, supposedly somewhat faster, but we decided to go for this, and then it turned up, and the initial software was absolutely terrible, and. Um, it had a Fortran compiler that it, it didn't work. I don't think it worked as fast as the one on the 709 had, even though the 75 must have been five or 10 times faster. And, and uh, it didn't have FMS. And uh, we, we, were, we were saved because A, A we had bags of, of processing power and uh, also, IBM gave us three people, or lent us three people um, to go to the 75 to get it going. And they were, they were extremely good, and one way or another they manhandled things so that we got over a period. And then we were rescued by Houston. The H in HASP stands for Houston. And of course, at that time, Houston. The, the Americans were involved in getting a man to the moon and, uh, and so Houston was rather in an important place and it had a 360-75 and uh, goodness knows what resources IBM gave them but they gave them enough resources that they wrote a modernised version of the FMS the Fortran monitor system <coughs> and with the Fortran monitor system on the 75, of course it was a mar mar it could run more, more multi programs, so you, you could have the 1130 function inside the 75, and it also had magnetic disks, and so instead of having tapes, the queues of jobs in a, and the, queue, the output queues were on disks. And so, 
with discs, y you can you can write take take something off the front of a queue and put something on the back of the queue without rewinding. And that meant that the batch aspect disappeared, but everybody still called it batch processing, but the batch aspect had disappeared. And, uh, and once, once has started to go, it, it, it was fine. Um, so, so we were rescued by Houston. Okay, it also allowed us to start to do something for the 75, two different things. One was uh, online editing of files, uh, the gradual demise of punch cards for programming. In fact, this was a really quite a difficult job because people were very expert at handling big programs that took several trays of cards like this. Um, they could make up cards and handle them very well. And in those days, you didn't have a 20-inch color screen and a mouse or anything like that. You had a selectric typewriter uh, as the terminal. If you, if you wanted to have online editing of programs and the programs kept in the machine, the device you were dealing with was a, was a typewriter, not a screen with a mouse. And so, actually, competing with cars was quite difficult. You see here the terminals. We've, we were, first of all, one only had that golf ball typewriter. And then they started to, people started making things called VDUs, visual display units, which, which was a, a small screen of 80 columns and, and about up to 20 lines or something like that. So that instead of paper where you could, uh, you, you, you know, you could, you, could, you could obviously see lines uh, um, on paper as well, but you, you could see what you were editing rather better. And then uh, there was also a storage tube, which, which came from the tech Tektronics who made uh, oscilloscopes. They did, developed uh, a, a, a tube in which you, you could uh, store an image, which would store an image without refreshing it. And you could use that to, to output graphs, uh, graphical information. And the other thing was, was RJE, remote job entry stations. And, uh, and the first thing we did was actually to take an 1130 and uh, put it um, in one of the experimental halls that was, I don't know what, a few hundred yards from, from the c computer room. And you could then put jobs in uh, there. And uh, if you did it on site, of course, there was no problem. And then we started doing it off-site. <coughs> and in those days, you would, you would uh, rent phone, private phone lines, which were point-to-point -point phone lines. And people uh, had developed mo modems so that you could run at 2.4 kilobits. Sounds ridiculous nowadays. Um, o over these private phone lines. Okay, then in, in November 1971, we, we bought, we rented the 75. We actually bought a 195 to replace the 75. And the con one of the conditions, it cost three million pounds, I should say. And one of the conditions was that 50% of it was for people who went were not the nuclear physicists at Rutherford, but other, other people who had large problems. And uh, a second, uh, 75, we bought second hand, I think, in 76. And the, 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 the 75, the original one, <coughs> ran until 1982. 
and um, I put languages there because a huge amount of effort went into programming languages. We, we occasionally put, we put PL1 and uh, I think Pascal and other languages, but nobody used them. I mean, Fortran just, just sort of soldiered on so, so that it, I mean, it, it was really, I mean, a huge amount of software effort went into language development, N not at the Rutherford, I should say, but all, elsewhere all over the world. And it had no effect whatsoever on us. Um, so the next, and the next one is this. This, this, this was how the seventy, the one ninety five, uh, developed, and uh, you can see we are there somewhere, Oxford near Oxford, and uh, the other 50% was, uh, well some of these places in nuclear physics places like CERN there, and uh, we also had a link to the ARPANET, um, and then all these remote job entry stations were where people were able to use the 195 from. Uh, I don't know when this, this, this map is from, it's from probably the late 70s. Um, okay, so it's, I'm actually going to end the big, the big machine era in 1982. But, uh, during this time, of course, there were other machines, not big machines. There were embedded machines. That's, that's machines built into something. There were single-use machines, the 1130s, an example of that, that, they had, that had sort of a one use. And, uh, and then gradually uh, time sharing, which I'll explain in a minute, started to come into play. Okay. These machines tended to be, to be programmed in, in, with the machine code of assemblers, essentially because only one program was being written. And, uh, and you had all the time in the world on the machine because it was used for nothing else. So it, it, it was a quite a reasonable thing. I mean, they used to have, you, you, you know, the, the contracts people always wanted to have Fortran compilers for these machines, but nobody ever used them. So, at any rate, the, the, one of the principal companies involved in these smaller machines was a company called DEC. And um, there was a technique called time sharing, which was that you had a big computer, you, you sat at a typewriter, and the effect was that you had the machine. You were a single user of this machine, although there were lots of you doing it, thinking exactly the same. And, uh, and that, was, that was called time sharing. And it, it was started by MIT, but it was sort of perfected by DEC with a machine called the, the PDP-10. And um, somehow or another, in 1975, I got involved. Engineers in universities wanted to buy a lot of PDP-10s. They, th they thought they their, their computing facilities were inadequate and so on and so forth. And uh, so in the usual way of these things, a delegation was set up to, to go to the United States and see what engineers were doing in the United States. And somehow or another, I, I, I was 
put on to this. And uh, it was a pretty motley band of people, I should say. And we went all over the United States visiting various places. But one place that we visited was a place called the Palo Alto Research Center, which belonged to the Xerox company. And there we saw a machine called the Alto. And That's a picture of the Alto. Actually, I don't remember it. I, 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 tr I try to look I, on, on the web for this sort of thing. Um, I remember it. Well, it was, the, 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 this, the screen there is right. It, 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 it was an A4 sized screen. And the screen I remember didn't have this sort of surround. It looked much more modern than this. And it was a single user machine. It was connected by an ethernet to backing store and printers and things. And then they, 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 they gave us a demonstration of this machine. And it, it, it had a graphic interface. And they, they, they drew a, a picture of a, a, of a kid, an urchin, so to speak. <laughs> And then they, then they gave him a ball, and they got him bouncing the ball from the keyboard. That, that in itself was quite impressive in those days. And then we went off and, we, we went off and looked at something else that you could do on the machine, something more conventional. And then he said, oh, I wonder what the boy's doing. And the boy came back, and of course the boy was still there, bouncing, bouncing the ball. And uh, I mean, this this was sort of a graphics interface and Windows for the first time that anyone, any one of the party of us had seen. And uh, and from there, then onwards, everybody was convinced that we'd all be using machines like that before long. It, 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 it was a sort of sea change <laughs> of how people were. Uh, was, was, the, was, the, was the altar. It, it didn't have colour, but it looked at, I mean, this I think was probably an earlier version than the one we saw. And the one we saw looked very, very smart. And, uh, and everybody was extremely impressed. So, what I'm going to say is that there was a switch, a crossover, that up until, I'm going to say, a date of 1982, there, there was the big machine sort of uh, line, and then there were the others. <coughs> and that in 1982, this crossed over, that the main line was the others, and that the big machines went off into supercomputers. People started, the big machines were crazed and things like this. But the, the, the normal users were starting to enter the personal computer era. <coughs> And uh, the reason I chose 1982 is when the first 90, 195 was switched off. Yeah, 195 was extraordinarily successful. It, it ran all the hours. It, I mean, I think they had three or four hours a month planned maintenance. And otherwise it just, you know, it was 168 hours a week it was running from. And it did and millions of jobs and so on in, the, in its years. And somebody calculated, goodness knows how, but, uh, but w what, what its output was worth in, in government units or something. I, the government has sort of standard units of what it costs to, to run something. Somebody made a calculation that it, it had actually done in its, in its 10 years 25 million pounds worth of work. 
and it had cost three million. So, at any rate, so the personal computer race and uh, the starters were the IBM PC, the Sun machine, the Apple. I've just put, there were numerous other outsiders. Perk was one that I think ICL sort of went with that for a, a bit, so I put that there. The non-starter was the Alta. Heaven only knows what happened to the Alta. Xerox were the most peculiar company. Uh, I mean, they had this marvelous park place, but as far as I know, nothing <laughs> ever, ever emanated for Xerox out of it. <laughs> and the winner was the IBM PC, and the runner-up was the Apple. And uh, it's, it's very interesting, and it summed up. I, I went to um, some trip to the States to a laboratory at Stanford, and they had decided that they had to standardize on, on, a, on a personal computer. And the choice was IBM or Apple. And everybody thought the Apple was best but the IBM PC won because it was open. You, everybody knew it, all the interfaces were published and so on and so forth. And so they decided we will go with that as the standard. It's, I, goodness knows, it would be, must be a very interesting story as to IBM, I don't think IBM ever had anything else that was open except the PC. And uh, so there you are, the PC one out, open design wins the day. Now, I, 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 I'm going to sort of skip a little along quickly, just odds and ends, because you know most of this. Um, I've picked out the BBC Micro, because uh, I think that was very important in getting uh, computers into the home. Certainly, uh, the first computer in my house was a BBC Micro, and I'm sure that was the case for a lot of people. I have a slightly interesting story because um, for some project or other, we, 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 we ordered a dozen of these things, and uh, the driver arrived a day late, and so rather jokingly, we sort of, you know, looked at watches, well, what are you doing here a day late? And then we had a great earful. He'd spent the whole of his weekend delivering 7,000 7, of these things. <laughs> and so, so that, that, that was how it was. Okay, and of course nowadays one has the internet with its email. In that drawing, I... Uh, uh, that, that picture of the, the network around the Rutherford, of course that, that had email going, but n not, not, n not the email that you have now, but <coughs> uh, uh, an email. And so, okay, there's the internet and the browser. Okay. I retired in 99. And... Um, I was, uh, I was more sort of arm twisted <laughs> to join the OEU immediately, which I had, had no intention of doing, because they were, they were running a course in uh, the technology, in communications technology, and they couldn't find tutors. And um, I, I, I found this interesting because the OU hadn't, since 99, the OU hadn't quite cottoned on to email and I get I guess the art in the art subjects people probably didn't have home computers but all the people that, that, that I was tutoring and here so they all had computers and so, so I used email uh, to communicate with them and uh, that was quite the, 
as you, as you might expect, the, the, their weak points were mathematics. And so my, I, I used to uh, write the solutions down in horrid, horrid detail and email it to them all. Um, I also found out one thing that I hopefully nowadays is completely gone, but they didn't realize that, that computers, if you, if you have to write something uh, like an essay, for some reason, the, 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 the OU always used to ask a question in an, an essay form, and uh, people didn't like this very much. And uh, they, they didn't realize that it's much easier to write an essay if you have a computer, because you don't have to start at the beginning, effectively. You can, you can start where you like. And I always used to say, you know, write some notes about things you want to put in, choose the easiest one, and write a paragraph about that. It sort of makes you, it gives you a good start, it makes you feel better. And, uh, and uh, so, so I taught my students, now, nowadays I hope they get that at school, how to, uh, how, how to write using a computer. And uh, I put Visual Basic in there because in some sense that that was I, as far as I know the first complete system for a, for a, a PC or for a personal computer it uh, it gave it gave you uh, everything you needed to to do a project it, it was rather interesting because I I, ha I had a an, an Austrian student working in my group, and, uh, and uh, I met him uh, I, uh, some while after, and he and a, and a mate had started a business to uh, in video, video conferencing, and um, I just casually asked him, you know, I knew he, they, they used PCs, and I said, what would you use on the, the PC? And he looked at me as if I was asking him a really stupid question. And he said, Visual Basic, of course. And uh, in some way or another, that was the first sort of complete... I, I didn't think of it, I didn't like it very much, but I used it to do something with telephones. And uh, it worked, but I didn't particularly like it. Now, of course, I had, I had the title of 60 years, and uh, so uh, I still do some things, and I use that lot, PHP, and MySQL, and, and the web stuff, and uh, I quite like PHP, but it's not it wouldn't take, it's very odd, it wouldn't take anybody who knew how to program in Fortran more than a few hours to pick up PHP. But uh, it's quite nice. And MySQL also. Okay, I said I would talk about computing and mathematics. <coughs> and I've picked out three different things. And the first one is relational databases. Ted, Ted Codd uh, wrote a paper in 1972, about a mathematical paper about using relations for, for databases. And uh, of course that, 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 that was mathematics and I, th I think some of somebody, he was at IBM, and somebody else at IBM, certainly not Ted God, turned it into SQL. And what is his name? Um, Ellison. Lenny Ellison founded Oracle and became so wealthy that he could afford to win the America's Cup yachting raised twice. Um, 
I don't exactly know why IBM didn't, didn't make a huge fortune out of it. But this is an enormous success because it's still used and it's almost everybody uses SQL. It's one of them and it's sort of the mathematical, it's almost the software success that's the most impressive of any. I don't know that people, people must use other things than SQL, but most, most of the normal applications people will use SQL. Okay, that's the, that's the first thing. I, I think I, I, I didn't say, I mean, when, when people said, that, I mean, computers were, were invented for doing mathematics. Um, so you, you might think that mathematics would sort of uh, be built in everywhere, and it isn't. The second, th the second thing is Tony Hoare's commun communicating sequential processes that, uh, that uh, was implemented in Ockham on transputers. And uh, that, that, that's been a sort of semi-success, I think. It's been used in, uh, in, in, in various ways. Unfortunately, that lot wasn't very successful. And thirdly, the third math that, that, that's mathematics. And the third mathematical thing that I thought of was, was APL, which is much earlier. APL was a language that had that used a large um, set of symbols for, for which IBM actually made a special golf ball um, to, to, for programming. And that, that hasn't been a success. I, I only know one person who, who, who actually used AP. He was a theoretical physicist. <laughs> Uh, 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 extremely <laughs> bright person. He said that uh, that um, using APL, you 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 used about a quarter. It was a quarter. This program was a quarter of the size of a Fortran program, and correspondingly, you could you could write it in a, a quarter of the time. But you, but my guess is you had to be pretty bright to do that. Um, and uh, that hasn't sort of caught on. I think people still mess about with it, but uh, that hasn't caught on. So somehow or another, uh, mathematics haven't actually interacted greatly with computing. What about this? About? This. This is found on Yes. It, yes. And it's hugely successful. And it's still successful, yes. Absolutely. Okay, I, perhaps I should have, uh, I'll add that. Um, it, 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 it doesn't have sort of totally a mathematical feel like these, but I agree with you. I, I would put that as another one. But, uh, okay. Then I said I would talk about status. <coughs> And uh, it's very interesting. From the very start, 1956, there was talk about a closed shop. Computers were too scarce and too valuable to allow use by anyone but an authorized expert. Right. I don't think that had a lot of mileage, to be, to be honest, but that was certainly around for several years after 56 while when I started. Um, and then there's programming computers as pro a profession. I think the BCS was sort of interested in that. Um, you know, in some ways or another, um, you know, should writing software be modeled on being a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or something. Okay. Uh, 
and programming as engineering. I, I'm a chartered engineer, but, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't tell anybody that. They might think I could actually do some real engineering. <laughs> um, so so the, uh, the, the, the perception, I mean, in, in English, engineering sort of doesn't have a very uh, well-defined meaning. Um, you know, they'll send an engineer out to fix your washing machine, and also, you know, an engineer will be designing, goodness knows what, a suspension bridge or something like that. Um, but, uh, so engineering and programming doesn't go very well. I tend to think of programmers and programming as being rather like writers. But, uh, I mean, the activity is somewhat similar. But if you call yourself a writer, that's fine. You're a journalist, or you write books, or you do something. But talking about yourself as a programmer, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean anything. Um, at first I didn't like the idea of calling programs applications. Um, that, that seems to be what has happened. But I have sort of changed my mind and uh, in many ways I think the word programming and programmer and programs should be dropped, if you one could, and uh, build around applications. I mean, there is coding and there is, I mean, it, it's, it's a very fraught area. I never know what to tell people that, that I do. Um, so, that's that. It's an interesting subject, I think. Where do I go? And finally, finish off. What's our current position? <laughs> well, nobody can complain about hardware. <clears throat> I mean, you can buy a, a terabyte of external storage for 30 or 40 quid. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, applications on, on, the, on, the, on the most part the government always seems to have problems with applications, but apart from that, um, obviously they're, I mean, for years and years, uh, the graphics and animation industry have had marvellous software, the electronic industry as well. And if you go down, if you walk down the road and have a tour of BMW, it's clear that uh, the car industry has some really good software. Okay, what about the problems? There are problems around. Clearly the big problem is that, dominating security. Horrible. Also, monopoly is a problem. Computing seems to sort of throw up monopolies. I mean, Google is a monopoly. Fortunately, I think they're fairly benign. I don't really know. I don't, I don't need to, I'm, I'm retired, so I don't need to advertise my wares. But I don't know what, how the situation is. I mean, if you don't appear on the first few pages of, of uh, Google for, for what you are selling, you're in, in trouble. So, uh, and Microsoft, of course, and Amazon, that it's very difficult to uh, know what to do about that. Then, I don't know why this is. There seems to be a pause, 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 
people don't seem to improve non-proprietary systems. I mean, HTML is lousy. Why hasn't anybody improved it? Why hasn't it been improved? I mean, you can go on a, a very big site and you can go on a page and it has one box and the cursor is not in the box. Right? I mean, that's almost like sort of sticking your fingers up at somebody. <laughs> Why is that? Well, HTML doesn't have any mechanism for putting the cursor in a box. You have to use JavaScript. And JavaScript opens a can of worms in some ways. You, you, you have tables in HTML and you can make a header of the table. But if you have a table that's scrolled, you can't stop the scrolling removing the header. Why doesn't somebody put these things right? I don't know. Perhaps there's no mechanism to do it. Okay. The other thing is that <clears throat> I think it, nobody's really yet got to the problem of dealing with complication. Everything gets more complicated. And uh, if anything goes wrong, what do you do about it? I, I have a, somebody gave us a present of a wireless that has a remote control. And all of a sudden, the remote control, I don't know why, probably I, I mispressed a button, the wrong button or something. It didn't work any longer. If I pressed it, the, the, the radio has a little message on it. it. It just put a message up. Whatever button I pressed, it just put the same message up and did nothing. I thought about this, golly, how am I going to read a manual to find out how to put this right? I suddenly had a brainwave. I took the battery out of the, the remote <laughs> control and put the battery back and it all worked perfectly. <coughs> um, no, no, I mean, you, you know, you, you, my, 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 I changed to Windows 10 and suddenly, um, I, I put the camera on, on, on the USB and I knew, knew that the computer makes a little noise if you do that, right? And then it didn't, funny, it didn't load the software. And then I loaded the software, oh, no camera on the system. Right. Now fortunately, if you furkle around enough in, 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 uh, in Windows, and go into the control panel, which is, has 50 possibilities, each of which possibilities has numerous other possibilities. You'll find somewhere or another, I don't know what, devices or something like this, and I went in there, and oh, you could actually, it actually had something that would uh, do, do, do some troubleshooting. And so, what? Oh, the driver was wrong. Now, how, how is... Your, your, your ordinary person who doesn't want to know anything about computers, how do they deal with that sort of situation? Heaven only knows. And so I put down there, dealing with complication <coughs> is, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, I think, a very serious problem that hasn't, uh, hasn't been solved. <coughs> okay, You need Finish. a teenager. Sorry? Be a teenager. Yeah, exactly. Yes, maybe that's the solution. We, we, we've all got to uh, disappear from the scene and then be all right. They all know that you, you, take, you take the battery out. That's why you do it. It is interesting, though, how that intuitive comprehension of how a system works. Sorry? It is interesting how that intuitive comprehension of how a system works is changing with, with, with age groups. Like, for example, how my parents look at using a computer, talking about the similar situations that you're in, to how I necessarily would interact and understand how to solve that, to having a six or seven year old that is intuitively able to self-navigate through a solution. Yes. Through a problem that I've had. 
mm. and that sense of learned behaviour is, is constantly evolving. So it's, it's not necessarily yes. solving or dealing with the, that level of complication, but our, our implied knowledge to how we've actually grown up is evolving. There seems to be a massive generation gap we see with IT um, in what, what's deemed a usable, a usable UI. So, so I yes, I, 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 I mean, I've thought about that as well, that mm -hmm. um, in some sense or another... Um, you know, young, youngsters are just going to be able to pick up things in much, much easier. Um, I, I don't know whether that all, is always going to work. Maybe it will. I think contrary that um, a lot of systems are ridiculously overcomplicated. Um, and I remember when I used to work for GEC, we had a big uh, IBM B6 mainframe, and uh, the the People who worked with it always used to say that uh, IBM was systems programmers selling one computer to a, but a systems programmer wanted to buy it. Excuse me, systems programmers who were the manufacturers talking to systems programmers who were the customers. And I think that mentality still exists in the computer industry. Uh, and a lot of applications, like you say, have different options and so on are ridiculously complicated. Apple has tried to escape from that. And Steve Jobs' ambition um, was to make everything really easy to use. To yes. some extent, he's agreed. He's, he's achieved this. But when you actually delve into it and try to design any other programs, suddenly all this systems program and stuff comes up, and it's ridiculously complicated again. But it's our fault, really, as, as computer professionals. Well, we manufacture things that are so complicated. Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether it's totally our fault, because, I mean, uh, what seems to me is, is, that this, is that the operating system is ridiculously complicated and overloaded, and most of it doesn't need to be there, and most people never use most of it. And, but in some ways or another, it, 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 it stops other people. I mean, uh, it, I mean, peop I mean, Microsoft sort of tried to collar the the browser business by by offering you a free, you know, still they still do. You you get a free browser w w with your with your operating system. Now, in some sense, the browser nowadays is is really something that's absolutely essential. But it certainly it isn't part of the operating system. And the only reason for putting it in the operating system are monopoly reasons, effectively, and to, to stop other people. Um, and, um, I mean, really, it would be nice to have an operating system that just did the, the tasks that, you know, manage the memory and start things and things like this, but not have a whole host of, of other things in it. Uh, my opinion is that this is problem uh, between usability for normal, normal people and what you want to do. Because, for example, you Ubuntu now Linux has a graphic user interface which allow even normal users to use it. But when there is some complication or you need some advanced configuration, you still need to go, go to the command line and do it manually. So that's the problem. You can do a really green user interface which will allow everyone to understand how to control it, but you will lose the precision in configuration. Because you're trying to design everything for everyone. So, and that's the biggest thing. If you're in a situation where you're trying to design a UI, what you find now is that, and, and if we're sticking out for a global market, you'll get feedback all the time. It doesn't have this functionality, it doesn't have this functionality, but you initially design it for a specific application, but people are wanting to adapt the technology to you for many, many different things, and you're bombarded with requests, so you're trying to satisfy everyone's requests, and it's just impossible. And then you, you've got the other opinion where are you limiting your market or your competition? What is, was, was, I, I mean, I haven't contracted to buy anything recently, but in the old days, the, the, one had uh, in Harwell a contracts department, and uh, they, they always wanted you to put more in 
the specification than you needed to, and they always wanted uh, um, a penalty clause. And uh, it, it was very hard to persuade people that, a, that a pe you'd already lost if you ever had to <laughs> invoke a penalty clause and all you were doing was getting a sort of slight pocket money for, you know, to compensate you slightly for losing. And that, uh, that it was really very, un very unimportant, that really what was important was to make the right choice. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and you didn't want to therefore overload the specification. I mean, I, I mean, it, it was a joke. People sort of always said, oh, well, the mini computer must have a Fortran compiler. And yet, they were never going to use it. And, and, and they're probably just as well, because people who have written the crudest possible <laughs> Fortran compiler to say they had one. Um, but uh, I don't know what things are like nowadays. I mean, what's very nice, I mean, I, as I say, I use, I use the uh, PHP and S, MySQL. I mean, th th these are really excellent things, and they are free, <laughs> which uh, which is very nice. And uh, and uh, I should say, oh, I, I didn't, didn't say this just to sort of confer. I I still do things. I I actually did something that was slightly interesting, a rather trivial thing. Somebody asked me to to write a program for the web that would convert longitude and latitude into OS grid, grid coordinates, right? Uh, which, which is, a, which is a, uh, in principle, a fairly straightforward task. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a map projection, and you've got to know what the dimensions uh, are and so on. And OK, and I did that. So I looked it up, I should say. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they'd given me some answers to check it out. And they were wrong by a small amount, like 100 meters and, and so on. And then I realized that it was not longitude and latitude as you would find in an atlas. It was, of course, GPS, longitude and latitude. And I discovered something that I suppose all the all the youngsters already know is that uh, the GPS longitude and latitude is different because uh, in order to get uh, missiles to land on a house at 5,000 miles you need a better model of the shape of the earth and in fact in GPS naught does not go through that big sign on Greenwich it's about a hundred meters I think to the east, but I'm not sure that I remember rightly. And to actually convert the longitude and latitude between GPS and the longitude and latitude used by the, the, the OS uh, is much harder. <laughs> and uh, I certainly couldn't do it without just copying <laughs> what somebody else had, <laughs> had done. But it, I, I, I was interested. I didn't know whether it was general knowledge that uh, the longitude and latitude, that longitude naught as defined by GPS does not go <laughs> through naught <laughs> at Greenwich. <laughs> anyway, I should finish. Well, thank you very much, John. Interesting stroll through uh, 60 years of, uh, of computing and, and, and programming, so thank you very much indeed.